Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be uh, with Chris Grant today. Chris is uh, responsible for uh, the work of AbilityNet. He's the area coordinator for Scotland, looking to make sure that they can teach digital skills and help people with disabilities. Chris, uh, we've communicated on Twitter a number of times. You've participated in Access Chat. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this side of Ability Net's work? Because we, you know, we're familiar with some of the stuff that they're doing um, as a pan disability charity, and we've had you know, um, other people from Ability Net on. But but this is the real, you know, where the rubber hits the road, the community work, right? So tell us yeah. all about what you're doing. So um, throughout the UK, we've got a big team of just over 350 volunteers, which is awesome, and we're providing support mainly to people with disabilities with, through visual who uh, vision, vision issues, stroke survivors, and their families to, act, to allow them access to technology. Uh, but it can be the basic of things too, we, you know, especially around the time of COVID, we've seen a lot of people come to us and say, can you help with WhatsApp? Can you help with social media? And it's, it is a tough one for everyone. So our volunteers try to empower individuals and groups so they can then be a bit more brave and use technology. And in this day and age, really, nobody should be terrified to use technology. And, and there's unfortunately a lot of people that are. So our volunteers try to, to just empower them to get back to a, a semi-normality with technology. And, and when, you know, the volunteers throughout the UK, you know, in the far parts of Orkney and Scotland, all the way down to Devon and Cornwall, um, so there's lots of different county coordinators um, who support the team, uh, Free Services in Warwick. Um, so it's really important that we all have a, a, you know, a big team relationship. Everyone works so well together. So we, we just want to keep pushing the, the free services. And of course, part of the free services, we've got all the fact sheets and different technologies to, to cover disabilities with lots of great hints and tips and a lot of good um, tutorials too through the My Computer My Way and um, through the, the website also. Excellent. And, and just sort of one point, I'm assuming that the, the sort of geographical boundaries were all drawn up by Assassinac because they've counted Scotland as a county. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I get that one quite a lot. Um, they yeah. say, you know, Scotland's not a county. And I say, I understand that completely. But <laughs> it, it was decided at the time and when I came, so I, I joined the Ability Net 18 months ago, yeah. and it was decided between Sarah Brain, who's the free services manager, myself, let's just make Scotland one, you know, one cord, you know, one county. There was talk about splitting it into five areas. Um, so you have like northeast Scotland, southeast Scotland, and we just we thought ah, let's do something different, and um, we started the team just to give you a, a, just a summary of two in Scotland. And now we're up just over 50, 53 or 54. Um, so, you know, it is important all the areas throughout the UK because, you know, we have to have such a pool, a pool of volunteers um, just to try and, you know, to support the service at the same time. But also it's about, you know, sharing skills in different counties. Yeah. No, I, I, and of course I was being facetious about the the, the, the Sassanac, but yeah, absolutely, it's, it's um, you know totally need to do stuff uh, in a coordinated way, and at the same time be local. I know Deborah's got a question. Um, yes, welcome to the program, Chris. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> I only know Sassanac if I'm saying that correctly because. I watch um, the, oh gosh, it totally flew out of my head, the wonderful Scottish English show um, that's on Showtime. So I can remember that, or maybe it stars. Anyway, but they use that word a lot, so wow. Okay, uh, hopefully I'm muted right now. <laughs> We're all having tongue-tying problems here. But when you say volunteers, um, t I, tell me what you mean by that, volunteers. I know that you know, AbilityNet is, you know, a large nonprofit in, you know, I, I perceive throughout um, the UK. Um, but what do you mean by volunteers? Um, the, you know, do you mind elaborating on that a little bit more? Yeah. So, so volunteers, so yeah, I'm a volunteer. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you're a staff member. No, I'm a volunteer. 
Um, so the, the county coordinators also volunteer. So there's people who've got, you know, a little experience of technology that wants to help others. So, that, you know, that I've hopefully that kind of, sum, you know, sums that part up with the volunteer side. But volunteers are people who obviously come freely forward and say, we want to help. How can we help? And with their skills that they've got, we can then turn that into a voluntary role to support others. Okay, so I understand what volunteer you know means, but I guess I'm not. I'm a little confused when you say you're a volunteer for AbilityNet. They, uh, I guess I'm a little confused. So you, I thought you worked for AbilityNet, but you volunteer. I think a volunteer is um, I'm doing work because I appreciate it and I love it, but it's free. And, and do I have that right assumption? Yep. And so I. Um, I always struggle a little bit um, in that I appreciate people with disabilities volunteering for free, but I also, of course, think that the work that you do is very powerful and we should pay for it. So, so the, I, I think I am still a little tiny bit confused about the model. So, because I see you doing a lot of stuff in Scotland. So you're, you're volunteering to help um, people that, and we were talking about it before we went on um, air about some of the work that you have done, and which is very powerful, but um, I, I just, I, I guess I need, I just don't understand that much about, uh, I think it's great they're getting volunteers, but do they have paid people in Scotland helping do this stuff also? No, we don't, um, we don't. So within free services, we have a, a, a very, very small team. Um, so we've got uh, Tim, Alex and Krita, who are awesome at what they do. And um, they answer our free 0800 number where a lot of our recommendations and referrals come in. Um, yeah, we've got the website that does that too. But the guys in Warwick are, are the three of them who are managed then by Sarah Brain, who's the free services manager. Um, so, you know, in Scotland, uh, you know, you're saying about the paid stuff. Actually, in the last couple of days, that question has come up so much from organizations saying, well, what hours do you work? I said, oh, I'll just work any hours I'm needed. And, you know, it's around trying to make yourself flexible because on average, in all honesty, just now, um, I can see volunteers like myself doing maybe 20, 30 hours just to, a week just to support people in the community. And it's, it's vital. You know, if somebody comes forward and says, I work full time, but I can give two hours a month, that's better than nothing. Right, I agree with that, but I also know that the work that you do is very valuable. So I'm um, hoping that, you know, when you know, you're volunteering with them that it could lead to potentially, you know, being paid to. I only say then that, that I, there are so many volunteers doing so many amazing work, but all over the world and we need it. But at the same time, um, I'm looking forward to a time when we volunteer. I mean that we value our volunteers a lot more. And if we're volunteering, you know, that it's going to lead to something where we have paid internships and paid apprenticeships and it leads to employment. And I, I don't know the situation um, where you are, Chris, and I know we're going to talk about it, but I do think it's very important that these organizations pay people with disabilities that are supporting people with disabilities and our elderly. So um, I, I'm very grateful for the work that you're doing. Yeah. You that, yeah. Did you want to say something, Neil? And I'll yeah, I did. And I think it's, um, I think it's going back to Chris's point about the, the time at the moment being unusual and the requirement being that much greater um, because of COVID-19 and, and, and people needing to suddenly access digital skills. Um, do you think, Chris, that as we come out of this, because I think this is a topic that we're all interested in now, um, that this is going to be the catalyst for a significant shift in how we actually um, view people and how we value people that are actually delivering these essential services and, and keeping society running. Because I think that, that, that there seems to be a much warmer sentiment, but do you think that this is going to be something that, that continues? I mean, I hope it does, but, uh, but what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, within... So I can just talk from an ability net perspective on that. Say we were quite busy um, leading up to COVID. And now I think 
pe people are worried if there's going to be a second wave of COVID. So people will automatically start to say, right, what technology can I get in place just in case it happens? Um, so I think people have to be prepared um, for a second, you know, a second wave. So families will try to get everyone on online now just to, you know, just to find that, you know, the, the tie, because you don't know how long COVID will stay with us for. It could be with us short term, long term. So people will want to get, you know, online shopping, huge one, because people say, well, we, we're not doing our shopping on the website or we don't feel comfortable. So we've got to be ready for that, Neil. And I think yeah. it's so important and, and you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's frightening on one level when you speak to people saying, you know, I've never used a piece of kit to saying, well, actually we need to, to use technology to do this. And family and friends need to get everyone connected. So then hopefully AbilityNet and other organizations can then go on to support them. Antonio, I think you, you wanted to make so, a point. So, Chris, so if you, if you look back for, for uh, the last couple of months, you know, even you know, for, for the same period of last year, uh, what, what changes have you observed in terms of the requests for help? Uh, uh, what uh, are the things that people are looking uh, to, to, for help and, and for you to, to reach them out? Yeah, first one, Antonio, is um, isolation. Um, so how can people use technology to be less isolated? How to use social media, how to use Messenger? So it's, you know, when you look at that side, it's the requests have been, you know, coming in steadily. But one, one big other key is we're seeing is third sector organizations and other charities saying to us, actually, we don't know how to use things like Teams. We don't know how to use Zoom. But uh, you know, everyone's, not everyone, but most charities come to us and say, we've got two or three members of staff or two or three volunteers. Can you just give them a bit of hand-holding with it? So I think that's been a big, you know, a big part to play in it, Antonio. Yeah, you were mentioning that some organizations uh, referring that, oh, our, our volunteers, our employees are not able to use this tool or that tool. Do you think that they were using, they were already using them before, but they were just there and nobody really cared much about them. They were just put aside. And now they feel that they, the need of using them? Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, speaking to somebody just there at the beginning of the week, and she said that she'd had a laptop for four years and never touched it once. So, and it's that kind of thing. You go, wow, okay. Um, so, we, I think some people go, yeah, we'll use technology. They'll buy it and they'll go, we will use it. But then they'll see something go, oh, we don't want to use it now. Um, so, but right now, um, you'd be amazed with some of the stories that's coming out. It's brilliant. And so it might also of... be that they didn't know how to use it. So that's why they never did it. And I'm sorry, Antonio. You, you, no, no, you... There's, a, there's a, this is also to creating a, a kind of a, a personal transformation. You know, you are using digital resources, but you are reframing how you seem to communicate. So there's, there's also this element. I think there's a, a positive element of it because it will reinforce skills and, and knowledge that then people will be able to use when we go back to normal. Uh, uh, and I think that that's one of the positive sides. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Chris, have you seen during the COVID-19 um, crisis that more um, elderly people uh, are, are using the hotline and asking for assistance? I know before we got on air, we were talking about, um, and I've talked about it before, my mom had very severe diabetes. She had what was called um, brittle diabetes, which is very, very scary because you have to constantly be changing the levels of your insulin depending upon where your blood sugar is. And it's, it's um, difficult enough that when she at first moved to Richmond, Virginia, um, they would not accept her in certain senior homes because it's so complicated. Um, and so luckily things balanced out a little bit and we figured that out, but she always really struggled with using the touch screen technology, which is such a blessing to people that, especially people that are blind, but 
she had such, she had lost so much sensitivity in her fingertips that she really couldn't swipe to get um, the tablet or the phone to respond to her. And we would go over and then I would be like, all you do is this. And, you know, she found me very irritating, which <laughs> I could see. No, but you're not, just... Deborah. You're not. Definitely not. No, no, no. Uh, all I you do is it. this. <laughs> all right. But it's, it's a shame when you're in the middle of the crisis. And I've never used that, that you know, using your example laptop before, probably because I'm afraid of it. I don't really know what I'm doing. And I'm just off until magically one day I'm going to know. You know, I, I do stuff like that too. I was looking at a Christmas present that somebody gave me that is actually a really cool Christmas present. It's technology and I need to put it in my car. It's a little um, Amazon um, Alexa for your car. And I just haven't seemed to have the moment to put that in my car. <laughs> It's not that hard, Deborah. But so I feel so sorry for people that are in these situations that are now in the middle of the crisis. And it's like, okay, by the way, if you want to not be lonely and you want to engage with people, all you do is you go to your computer, you go to Zoom, and they're like, go to my computer or just go to your tablet. And I think of my mom, just put your finger on and swipe it. So I was just curious, are you seeing an uptick in calls from elderly um, people that are really struggling to stay you know, um, in touch with their loved ones during these times? Uh, we are. Um, so, so particularly in COVID, um, there's been a lot of, you know, we, we go on to different calls, COVID response resilience. And what each and every one is saying is there's elderly people that are struggling in the community with technology. And it's, so we need to find you know that the, 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 with the technology side we need to find that happy medium almost that we're not pushing too much technology to people who are elderly who really are frightened to use it and we do it at baby steps um, and just talk people through nice and slowly and don't over complicate it so for example if somebody phones us and say right okay we want to go on the internet and do our grocery shopping so that's Step one, in my opinion, getting them online. But step two, you know, you could go and say, actually, you know, you can go into Facebook and social media and whatever else. And I think you've got to be, as, as I've said to colleagues and, and other volunteers too, we have to be so careful when an elderly person phones that say if they say to us, again, around the shopping, we're not going to go into a ram ramble and say, you can do this, 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 and this because that puts them off. And it's, we need to- we, Right, we need it to, discourages them. It just, yeah. and, and also, a lot of times people's self-esteem self is tied to this. So it's like, well, the only reason why everybody else in the world can swipe their phone on is because obviously they're smarter than me, when that's not, that's not ca the case. You know, there, are, there were some realities with neuropathy and stuff with my mom's fingers. But I think often we, um, we do send the wrong message um, that, well, everybody's on it. What do you mean? Why? And, and it makes things a little bit worse and makes people a little bit more fearful of trying as well. And it, once again, is this the time to do it in the middle of a crisis? Well, people have to have access. So, you know, but it, the sensitivity of it, I think, is a very important point. Yeah, 100%. Excellent. So, um what are the, the sort of top tips that you would give for people that are maybe helping their elderly relatives to, you know, with, with the sort of dipping their toes in the water, if you like, with, with video conferencing and, and, and stuff like that, uh, other than to be exceedingly patient? Yeah, there is that. Um, I'm teaching. Well, I've, I help my mum at times. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she's not elderly. Um, oh, I better not say too much, you know. And, uh, and I know that the parts that she struggles with. However, I think the main key points really on, on that, you know, note you've made, Neil, is you look at three things, in my opinion. So the first one is the, the safety element is key, is vital. Um, yes. It's... 
people go, right, okay, antivirus is key, which it is. You've got to make sure that PC is tight. But the second thing is have regular discussions with them saying, you know, how are you, how are you getting on with the technology? How, do, how are we getting on with, you know, with Messenger or something like that? Because there are, there are individuals out there that will almost kind of home down on people and, and, you know, hit their vulnerability. And somebody might go, oh, I know them. And it's actually somebody scamming. You know, you get all these messages. So I think you've, the second one, obviously, is to have discussions. But third, the third one around the video calling is just to make sure that the person understands what to do in case something is wrong um, around it. Say if somebody comes on the call you don't know and, and they're you know abusive or anything, get them off the screen immediately, where to press, because it will cause people distress. And we've seen that, you know, in media in the last couple of weeks. Um, that you know these people some people are coming on to Zoom calls and, and Zoom bombing is is the new jargon I'm hearing. Um, so I think you know that's the top three I would say, Neil. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that's really useful. I think that the other thing that I've noticed is the nervousness around the the whole scamming piece. So, so yes, we've got to instill the capability um, in the people that we're teaching to keep themselves safe. But they're also sometimes overly conscious of this. So they don't want, they, there's almost this sort of fear breeding paralysis um, that everybody's out there to predate on them and that, you know, everything's going to be, get, get stolen. So they don't want to buy online. Um, have you seen that? that Cause I've seen that quite a lot. It's like, Oh, I don't want to do that online. I'd rather go to the shop where I trust Fred. Um, have you seen a, 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 you know, a change in attitude or, or do you just think people are being forced to do it and now they're going to, maybe that will lead to a change in, in attitude because they're going to have to overcome their fear um, because there's, otherwise they don't get food. It's a bit of both. Right. Um, it's, a lot of people say, well, we don't want to shop online because we actually enjoy going to the shops. Yeah. So we, we wouldn't think about, you know, because we, we go and when we're in the shops, oh, we'll bump into X, Y and Z and have a chat with them, where some people are actually scared. That, you know, obviously, friends and family may have been telling them things leading up to get on to online. You, you hear things in the media, and which scares people. One thing around that is, though, the remote support, I find, which is interesting, because when you say the word remote, people worry because of the scams that are going around, and particularly with the use you know, of, of things like TeamViewer. And to me, it's quite safe because you've got your username and your password to connect into to their machine. Yeah. And, and they're worried that because they've read something online, it's all bad. So they won't ask for the help remotely, but they'll prefer face to face. And, you know, sure. people, are, but the attitude is changing, but it's taking time to change. It's not, you know, I would say it's taken about 20, we're at 20, 25% still quite low to change the attitude and even if we get to 50 percent as as you know as across the world and um, that people are just a bit more comfortable and the thing is, is again it's you've just got to make sure people are comfortable and people stay safe that's the main thing yeah ab absolutely yeah people's safety is 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 paramount but at, at the same time the the fear of danger sometimes is amplified because you know, we, we like to focus on the negative. Uh, of course, that social interaction of going to the shops, uh, it, we're all missing, you know, face to face physical contact with people right now, or, or most of us are not everyone. There are people out there that are professing to be enjoying lockdown and isolation and they're welcome to it. Um, but I, I, I guess the, you know, that, that whole thing about being able to bring people together is, is, is so important and, and maybe actually giving people the skills now because they're being forced to might actually help because is isolation loneliness is really bad for people's health. Right. So, mm. um, you know, what the work that you're doing is, is, you know, potentially not just enabling them to use technology it's 
improvement in their health, their well-being, and probably their finances as well, because once they get over the, 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 the sort of fear of using these services, they'll actually benefit financially because it's cheaper. Yeah. What, other, what other bits of advice do you have um, in terms of, are there particularly um, easy to use, you know, are there, are there sort of shops that, that, that are easier? Are there um, some banks that are doing better job than others? Uh, in terms of making it easier for older people, uh, you know, can are there, you know, and can you share some good examples of, of uh, products and services that the your the people you're helping are, are, are really taking to? Yeah, so I think the, the the first one is actually a device called the Comp device um, from No Isolation, and that to me is a fantastic piece of kit. It's very simple, and what just to give you a brief oversight is it's essentially it's a it's a screen uh, a screen uh, you know 17 inch or something like that and they can go and can um, the person puts a plug on at the wall just switches it on that's all the, the end user would need to do but to keep in touch with their family the, the family and friends download an app the comp app the, when the person turns the screen on they'll be presented with a code and then when the person's on the on the the account as a friend or family, they can then directly dial into that person, so it doesn't have to go over and over and over again. So it's a one-off, you know, thing. It's not constant. So I think No Isolation are doing an excellent job with the Comp device, um, and and they've seen a lot of. I know by talking to the guys at Comp, um, we've got some out in trial in, in Scotland and indeed across the UK. Um, and I've had a shot of it and I was really impressed. Um, so again, the comp device is a really good one, but supermarket wise, I think Tesco's are doing it really well just now. I have to say all supermarkets are, you know, as I keep saying to people are key, the, the, you know, these frontline workers, I would class supermarket workers as frontline because essentially they're doing a job for us at the end of the day, but Tesco's um, brought in the, the new 800 number which has been generated around. And if you're on the if you're not on the government's list, you can then call this 0800 number to get added to that list. Um, but there are other supermarkets and they've not kind of taken on board a few things. And, and you know, talking to people with, for example, with visual impairment issues, um, you know, they're worried about going into a supermarket just now. But they couldn't get a slot for shopping, so I think probably the likes of Tesco's and Co-op and there's other there's other supermarkets out there have done it, has got this internet shopping key, and it's you know it helps. Now this 0800 number, even if you're not on the NHS registered or the government registered vulnerability list, you can still get the the, the support from Tesco's, as long as you have a vulnerability and there's nobody else to help you. And they will give you a guaranteed slot once a week. And yet they, they give you quite long time scales between ten and I think it's ten and six, uh, ten and four, and then you know two and ten. And it's to me it's fantastic, um, what they've done. And there's supermarkets that have taken out these um, volunteer cards where somebody can instead of giving them cash, they can keep regular topping it up. You know, so that volunteer could take the card, the person could phone whatever supermarket is and say right I want to put another 20 pound on it instead of being worried right I'm handing over cash because you can't go and give somebody your bank card to go and get you a bit of shopping um, because obviously it's against the law um, so again I think there, there are organizations and sh um, companies that are doing it really well but I think everyone's been pushed into the deep end all at once because I don't think we expected this to happen so quick so now with, with COVID and with, with everything else going on, I think perhaps when we come to wave two, um, when it comes to that, it's, uh, it's people are more geared for it and, and companies are more geared up for it. Excellent. I, I think the, the point you made about sort of these cards is, is, is really useful. Um, and I know 
also uh, an applause to Tesco, which I didn't know about for, for actually adding people to the list because we know that the government list is not right um, because people were sort of delivering food parcels to the wrong places because they'd got old information and all the rest of it. And then people that are truly vulnerable uh, are not getting that, that stuff. So kudos to them. Um, <laughs> I, I think also, you know, the the fact that you can get shopping once a week is is great. You know, I signed up with online services, and you know, I, I've made the mistake several times now, thinking, "Yeah, I've got to slot that uh, pile stuff in," and then only to find out that it's in ten days' time. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, the covers are looking pretty bare at the moment. I mean, we've got plenty of tin stuff; we'll never starve. But but you know. Um, I kind of miscalculated that one. So, uh, so I think that's interesting. So, um, just before, before we go and, and you know, I, I, and I do want to thank our supporters, my clear text who are on here captioning now, Elaine, uh, Michael Link and, and Barclays. Is there anything else that you would like to, to, to sort of tell people about, um, or encourage people to do, um, that can help keep people included, uh, during these, uh, strange times? Yeah, I think it's just asking that question, really. Um, are, are you using technology and do you need any help? Um, a lot of people will say no, uh, but just keep chipping away at it because you would be amazed. Um, you know, somebody might be too, too, you know, that they've been a hindrance. So if, if the main thing is ask for help, never be scared to ask for help. There's lots of great charities and organizations out there that will help you. Um, I think the other thing too, just I'd like to, to add is about the ability net live um, on a, which you can go on the website, which is our response to part of COVID, another webinar type um, based um, meeting. And it was really, really interesting. There's always good speakers and there's always good subjects. So we had one on digital safety and um, which um, Sarah Botchel, our, our market manager arranged. And um, again, there's lots of information on the ability net website because these are free to attend. So, you know, keep learning learn new things and um, there's so much out there that you could learn you could go onto youtube and go oh, that I like that device um, and actually start learning it because you never know who in your community might need the help but i think my key message i would put out there to if anyone needs help is ask for it any charity just ask for the help because i think most charities need to work together particular during covid actually always um, that we need to keep building relationships so we can help each other's clients. Excellent. Thank you. That's a, a great point to close on because I think that collaboration is absolutely key to inclusion. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to, to finally get you on here, Chris. Robin, thanks, Neil. Thank you, Chris. Thanks.